the first step of every vintage is cutting off most of what happened last year. Every lesson from the years past gets poured in to try and understand how to make the best out of that vintage. We really get one chance a year to make that wine from that place. If I lose the fruit out of a vineyard, it's gone. Try again next year. Most winemakers are control freaks. Nature doesn't really follow those rules. I do a lot of rain dances, sun dances. Whatever you need to do, you're still farming. As a friend of mine said, sometimes nature is just a mother. <laughs> End quote. End quote, yeah. <laughs> There's something so irresistibly romantic about vineyards and the allure of the wine. Each individual location has its own story that we try to capture in a bottle. For Robert Parker, he loves complex wine. This has all of that. It's the definition and the detail that make a great vintage, and 13 had all of it. The stars kind of lined up. It was perfect. Wine is meant to be enjoyed with people that you love. And when the company is good, the wine is always good. That is the 13 vintage in liquid form. <laughs> exactly. Fred Ricciani of TSC. I am joined by the filmmaker of A Perfect Vintage, the documentary film you just saw in the trailer right there. This has been a labor of love, a great look at the winemaking process, all the trials, the tribulations to get to the point where you can purchase it in a bottle. Troy, thank you so much for the time. How's everything going? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me. I appreciate it very much. Things are going well. It's an exciting time. Anytime you uh, put a work of art or a passion, especially a passion project out into the public, it's uh, very exciting to get a little love back. You know, it's, uh, here's an interesting story. I started my career in music and in theater and dance, right? So you do a theater production, you get it right then. As soon as the, the curtain goes down, people are clapping, you get that, that instant gratification. And particularly doing a film in this climate with the pandemic and everything, doing the film festival circuit, but you can't really get in rooms with people. So it's really, I have to say, it's really a nice part of the experience to be getting some love and having people get to see it and respond to it and, and let me know how they felt about it. How does it feel after all these years to finally really have it out there to a wider audience? Brother, I have to tell you, it was, there are some really significant things that happen along the way. So the first one is technology changes. So when I started this in 2013, my brother's a winemaker in Napa and I decided to follow him for a year and do a little kind of a spiel on him and it grew into this thing. But during that time, we went from HD footage to 4K footage and from a GoPro drone to a Mavic Pro to a unique drone. So technology changes was a thing. So now you're editing this footage that's got all these disparate sources and, and new cameras and high def stuff coming out. And the other change along the way was that I always say it's better to be lucky than good. So one of the wines that I covered in 2013, which happened to be a spectacular vintage in California, my brother one day just sent me an email and it showed this review from Robert Parker Jr., who was at the time the world's biggest wine critic. And he scored one of the wines that we covered, a perfect 100 score. And wow. so the original name, my brother, we have different dads. My brother's name is Timothy Milos. And it was originally going to be Vino de Milos. It grew from there and there's other winemakers involved. But uh, after getting that score, I was like, well, wait a minute. This changes the stakes a little bit. So it was a perfect vintage, literally and figuratively. Funny how that worked out. And I can confirm as somebody that's been in the media business for a while who started working on documentaries, actually around the time you started your documentary, yeah, a lot has changed with the equipment, with everything else. I mean, you know, who could have foreseen, you know, five, within like five, six years, you're going to be upgrading everything to 4K, making sure it's all compatible, making sure you have a computer or computers that can run it, servers. Completely. It's a, it, the technological changes were a, a huge challenge, a huge challenge. And I actually went back and shot a couple of the really nice things that I had uh, with a new camera or with a new drone just because... I know what the shot is, it's in there already, but I can just make it better. And since I have family in the Bay Area, it was, first of all, it's an awful thing to have a winemaker in your family. I, I highly <laughs> recommend it. And then to have family who lives in the Bay Area and particularly in Napa, it's pretty nice to get up there and hang out and do a project and have a reason to go back. I mean, I had to go back. 
to reshoot that. Th- I mean, I had to. It was would have been rude not to, right? Definitely. And as, as I mentioned to you off the air, you know, I, I do drink a little bit of wine, but yeah, I had no idea about the whole process and everything else. And that, that documentary really opened my eyes to that. Of course, you have your brother who is in the wine business. But in the process of filming this over the course of these last few years, was there anything that surprised even you? Well, I, like you, went into it not knowing that much about the process. So it was all a surprise. It was the whole thing was a discovery all along the way. Um, if there were, if there was a, a humongous surprise, uh, you know, just learning the technical stuff. My brother uh, not only a, is a winemaker, but also a scientist. So learning about the science of wine and, and you see foot stomping and people with their hands in the grapes and all that kind of stuff and learning that there's... Uh, pathogens don't grow in wine. So people always say, oh, that's gross, feed in the wine. And then you learn these things about the winemaking process or the fact that they pick the grapes. And here, this is probably the most intriguing bit about winemaking. Imagine your favorite banana and you buy it and it's a little bit green. And if you eat it, it's got that green flavor. And then they get a little couple brown spots and they get sweeter. And then shortly thereafter, you should be making banana bread with that stuff because it's like way too sweet. Well, grapes do the same thing. So the critical thing and what makes kind of what separates winemakers is the person who can taste that grape when it's hanging on the vine and determine when it's the perfect ripeness for what they're aiming for for the wine in the end. Because once you pick it, it doesn't keep changing because of the processes that happen. It's like, this is my picking decision is this. And that's the decision you can't unmake because you can't go, oh, it's a little unripe. Let me put it back on the, the vine, you know, so seeing that they there's so much weighing on that one decision. What day are we picking this fruit? And then what happens after the fruit after? So that was very fascinating for me. What was interesting for me, and I don't think I had witnessed this before in person or, or watching on video, the tasting of the dirt. Can you explain that whole process? Well, there's a concept in, in and you've got to watch the film to learn more about this and have the winemakers tell you all about it. But um, not to you, but to the viewers at home. But um, there's a concept in wine called terroir, and it's how the soil and the climate and the uh, sun and the, the weather and how basically how Mother Nature uh, affects the grapes that are grown in that specific site. So certain places have a little bit of a cooling breeze coming in, so the grapes kind of shut down earlier, or how much sunshine do they get? Or what is the soil like? One of the things they talk about on, in the film is that when you get some of that mountain fruit, the vineyards up there, there's chaparral, there's pine trees and pine needles and leaves and uh, wild herbs that are up on the mountain that land in the soil. And then can you taste that in the wine? And you can. There's certain places in wine that are famous for Rutherford, the Rutherford dust concept, or certain places and certain things. And you just have to think about it. And and that brings up a whole other point that I don't want to go into because there's a little bit of a downer, but I will just a little bit. They've had all the fires up there lately, so they've been having to deal with smoked grapes. And the, the reason I bring that up is the fact that things that touch the grapes and the vines, whether it's smoke in the air or the herbs that I was describing or the the trees or the soil, completely affect what you taste in the bottle. Aside from grapes, it's all that other stuff mixed in there. And when you get to those master psalms and those people who really have that incredible palate, they're able to taste that thing and go, this comes from this appellation in France. And I'm saying, are you an alien? How can you smell that? How can you taste that? But you literally can taste. And I, you, it's not like tasting the dirt, but you are. It's tasting the place. And that's the winemaker's job is to take what the earth and Mother Nature gives you and make it to the best expression of that place. And if you can taste the place, the winemaker got out of the way just enough to do his job perfectly. The wine scoring system, which I feel like out of any scoring system on planet Earth, it's got to be the most objective because, as you mentioned, there's so many different factors that can affect the taste of the wine. So and, when you were diving into this whole scoring system and everything, I mean, what, what's your whole uh, take on it as the filmmaker kind of getting the both sides of the coin? It's an interesting thing. Um, I would say the closest thing to it would be scoring uh, or rating music, right? 
there's there's a trick about it because it's really subjective. It's one palette, maybe a few palettes. We all like you like vanilla, I like chocolate. You like green grapes, I like red grapes. You like Chardonnay, I like Cabernet. It's all that kind of thing. So it's exceptionally subjective. The people who are rating it generally have a pretty sophisticated palate so they can dive into whether there are any flaws in the wine. But here's what you do. So if you have a movie critic that you that that you always say, oh, I agree with that movie critic. Or if there's a, a music critic or a, a sports announcer, Stephen A. Smith, New Yorker, speaking of New York, New Jersey. It's like if you align with that person's philosophy and if that person's taste buds in this case, then you take the score with a grain of salt, but hopefully they've written a blurb that goes along with it. It says if you like wines that have notes of caramel and and vanilla and allspice and clove and chocolate, then that's the wine for you. And so um, what my advice about the scoring system would be learn about what you like and fo- and find the reviewers and that you align with and follow them because they'll lead you to generally time and again to things that your palate likes. We obviously know a lot of the challenges or at least some of the challenges that these winemakers have to go through with, with mother nature. You mentioned the fires, of course you covered in the documentary, the, the frost as well, which I, I never thought about. Of course, California at times has had a bit, a bit of a water crisis, you know, to say the least. So all that stuff combined kind of makes a perfect storm. When it came to filming this documentary, what were some of the challenges that you faced over the years? Uh, getting up early. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, well, the technological changes, but but also be when you're doing a documentary, part of the magic is being in the right place at the right time. So there was the, this concept that you've seen, you see, saw a lot of in the film about the balloons, and I thought to myself. When you have a, a, the journey of a grape or a season, it's, you're very much at the whims of Mother Nature. And as I was seeing these balloons over Napa, I would say to my brother, I was like, wow, the flight of a balloon is, reminds me of the life of the grapes or the journey of a season because you need the temperatures and the wind and you can coax it with the, you know, the fire to get you up in the air but you're really trying to navigate something that you're not in full control of. Well, so I set out to capture these balloons. So I'd getting up at four in the morning and trying to find, they take, would take off at different places every day. So there's this one morning, my buddy, Tom Graves, who came in, who was the drone pilot for much of the film and worked with me starting on about year three and still is a a co-producer on the film and did some amazing work. But he and I were up one morning and we went to try to find we found the hotel where they were meeting the people who were going to fly in the balloons that day. We got to the hotel. There's no one there. We saw a van that said balloons over Napa, but nobody. We said, well, the sun's rising. We want to get the sunrise. So we want to get the balloons. Well, let's just get out of here. Let's go, just go try to find it. So we're driving up the, the freeway or the, the two-lane road in Napa, Highway 29, and this van comes flying by us, and it's balloons over Napa. We go, follow that van. He turns off and he goes into some back road and we go, oh, forget it. We're just, let's just go get the sunrise. Still trying desperately to capture this moment that was in my head. I go, just turn left down here. There's a, it's a dirt road. Let's go over here. And I, I see this kind of spot that was designed, a dirt little elevated area that you could um, wash a tractor on. And I said, well, let's put a camera up there and catch the sunrise. And I look to my left and within 15 minutes, I see this giant air balloon filling up about a half mile to my left. So it's filling up. Next thing I know, there's a balloon going up and a balloon going up. And we're right in the middle of this balloon fest. And the balloons go down the valley and they come back up the valley. How are they doing this? But we're filming it. We got a drone in the air. It's awesome. And next thing you know, these balloons come and they land in the field right next to us. Literally, I was 200 yards from where the balloons landed. So... um, to answer your question, it's oftentimes better to be lucky than good because one of the challenges in a documentary is how do you make, how do you see these organic things? I, I bet you saw my octopus teacher. I think to myself, okay, so this guy's underwater and he's capturing this octopus doing his thing 
and he's holding his breath while he's doing it. And that takes it to a whole other level. But literally being in the right place at the right time when these magical moments happen, or, or you'll see some of the imagery that I caught, this beautiful double rainbow that I caught, and, and just many of the things that happen that were, you have to be very fortunate to be there. So that was a challenge, and, uh, but a fun challenge, fun challenge. And of course, people go check it out, aperfectvintage.com, stream it on all major platforms. I got to ask you too, because you mentioned music background, theater background. So you've been in this media entertainment world for quite some time now. What was your first introduction to film? I started as a musician, did that, went to New York, lived there for a while, uh, was your neighbor for a minute and uh, danced on Broadway. So I had a dance career that took me into a choreography career and then creative directing career. And at one point back when, remember those commercials, does it tapes fit, do the tapes fit in my VCR? <laughs> so I um, start, I got a camera and started filming stuff so I could basically document my artistic work and try to put my choreography reel together and my acting reel and all those things that I was doing. And when I started editing, it all just made sense. It was um, timing, composition, choreography, rhythm, visuals and the whole filmmaking thing was like light bulb oh that's it that's what i'm supposed to do instantly and and it it's funny because i was a really good dancer but not barishnikov really great sax player not david sanborn um really good at all these things but kind of my biggest gift is the fact that i speak all these different languages i i always uh try to surprise people when I go into a dance rehearsal and there's a band and I'll go over and I'll start talking about, you know, that eighth note on the end of four. And they're, they're like, how do you know about that? Or, or I go in as a camera operator and then I'm telling the dancers that, hey, you know that step you do on the end of three with the bot ma and the thing? And they're like, and so I speak a lot of languages and that's been, um, I think my greatest asset. And the other thing is that I'm pretty personable. So when you're sitting, it, there's a real art to sitting and doing interviews and coaxing the story that you want to tell organically and getting people to feel comfortable and be able to, to talk to you and deliver a performance that you can use on camera. That's another uh, skill set of mine. So it's, um, the whole is better than the sum of the parts for me. You know, it's all those languages, all that stuff rolled in together makes me be a, what I consider a pretty good filmmaker. That's awesome. Are, are there any other films or work that we should look out for on the horizon? Of course, a perfect vintage.com. We could all check it out, but anything else we could find from Troy Christian? Uh, yeah, well, so my background, I grew up in the Haight-Ashbury as a kid and my dad was the bass player for Jerry Garcia just before the Grateful Dead. Wow. And yeah, so, and then my mom was Lenny Bruce's secretary. So I've got this kind of colored past that goes all the way back to the early civil rights movement, the hippies, the summer of love. So I'm kind of working on a thing. I've got some never before seen footage of my dad playing with Jerry Garcia and a bunch of other things. So um, that that's a, a thing that's happening. I've also got a short film that's out that's about it's a kind of a little kids dance movie. And uh, yeah, just be doing creative stuff all the time. That's that's what we're doing. So. Look for that though. I don't. I don't have a name for it yet, but I'm. I've already started the principal t photography and been interviewing some people from back in the day, some musicians that made a difference. And I think that that one of the most interesting things about that time in the '60s is the music that came out of that era, right? So, from the Beatles and the Grateful Dead and Jefferson Starship, not even airplane, uh, Jefferson Airplane, not even Starship and all that stuff that happened in the Bay Area. And I was a kid right in the middle of it and I had no idea at the time. So it's a fun to take a look back at that and that will be coming your way. Excellent. We're definitely looking forward to that. You're so well-rounded and you talk about figuratively speaking all these different languages. And not only is that super impressive, I think that's super inspirational because a lot of times, whether it be in the entertainment industry or in any job, right? They they, they put you in a box or you feel like that you're in a box that you can't do anything else and that you're just, you know, okay, I'm just a project manager. Or, oh, I'm just a, a singer or sax player. And you said kind of like, screw it. I'm, I'm this, I'm that. And it's led you to doing filmmaking, which is what you're really truly passionate about for anybody watching or listening to this. What's the best piece of advice you give them on success and adapting over time? Well, you, you bring up an exceptional point. Uh, my whole life, people would say, well, well, what are you? And I would say, well, I'm all these things. And they, they would say in the entertainment industry, it's like they, people want to say, 
oh, it, it, the movie is like that movie, or the song sounds like that artist, and they always need to put you in a box. It's taken me longer to get where I am because of that, because I'm a dancer. Yes, I'm a dancer. I'm a choreographer. Yes, and I'm a musician, and I'm a this, and I'm a that. And it's, t it's taken, I believe, in my career, people a long time to come to the realization that I am all of those things. But what's cool about today's world with TikTok, with social media, with Instagram, with all the platforms, you're able to put your stuff out there now. You, you have your own network, your own platform at your fingertips. So my biggest advice is do you, be who you are, and start putting it out there. There was, back in the day, there was a, a, what's, I forget, there was a famous actor who said, I don't care where you are, get to Los Angeles and begin. And that's what you have to do. You have to move to Hollywood or New York. And if you want to be an actor, you got to get there and start. And you don't have to even move anywhere, right? You don't have to go to New York or Hollywood anymore. You just have to start and find your voice, stay true to it and put it out there. And most of all, have fun doing it. Because if you're having fun doing it, you know what they say, you're, if you have fun do, doing what you do, you don't work a day in your life. So do it. Get in. Fantastic advice, Troy. We really do appreciate the time. Before we let you go, in one line or less, why should people check out A Perfect Vintage? It's the perfect pairing for a good glass of wine. And there's so many wine lovers out there. And even if you don't dig wine, like, you know, if it's not your thing, it's it's uh, it's an hour and a half well spent. And it'll, I'm sure that you'll be able to associate with the passion of the winemakers and the passion of the filmmaker. It's a must watch. I love the wine. It's got the prop ready to go. There you go. We really do appreciate the time, Troy. You can check out his film, A Perfect Vintage, a perfectvintage.com. Stream on all major platforms. Anywhere we can find you online on social media? Uh, TroyChristian.com. And uh, you at, at Troy Christian on Instagram, please come and check it out. I just took my own advice. I just started my TikTok channel. So, um, that's happening. I'm going to be sharing in one last aside is that in filming this uh, film, I traveled to France and Tuscany and all over these places and filmed these beautiful areas and locations and much of California. And you don't get to use all the footage. You have to, it's 90 minutes worth, but I've got six terabytes worth of this incredible footage from around the world. So on my Instagram reels and on my TikTok, you'll be seeing a bunch of the footage that didn't make the final cut but it's pretty enjoyable to watch. So come and find me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. I don't, I leave the Snapchat to the youngsters, to be honest. <laughs> hey, that's fair. You're doing pretty well yourself. I, I like it though. I, I dig it. A perfect vintage.com. Troy, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks to all you out there. Enjoy the film.